terms of cave, white tiles, and spring bed. Eastern European wartime rumors in comparative perspective. This is my BNN lecture. My name is Petr Janeček. I work as associate professor at the Charles University in Prague in Czechia. Uh, this lecture will last about 30 or 40 minutes. First of all, sorry for my English. Actually, it's not English. It's a special, very specific language, peculiar language called Chinglish. It's Czech language and English language combined. So I hope you will understand at least parts of it. I have PowerPoint slides, or at least you can read if you don't understand. My spoken word. I also do not have very good uh, equipment, so I believe you will be able to hear this something. Okay, so let's start. My lecture uh, will have following structure. First of all, I will briefly talk about academic, mostly folklore research on wartime rumors and legends. It will be a very short overview of this topic. Uh, second part will be basically the meat of my lecture. I will talk about fabled Privit Kieva, Ghost of Kiev, a heroic legend of the uh, current Ukrainian conflict. Then I will briefly touch the subject of another heroic legend, which is a rather failed media legend about the Ukrainian Reaper. Then I will briefly talk about the legend about the white tides. I will discuss if there is a comeback of the classic Russian war legend, which we know from the former conflict of the Russian Federation in the last decades. And finally, uh, there, there will be short discussion, new legends, old teams, and and what we do about with this kind of kind of stories, which are uh, spread mostly online today, if we treat them as folkloric texts, or if it's just hoaxes or fake news or disinformation of propaganda. So let's begin. Okay. First of all, let's talk about the research on wartime rumors and legends in general. The rumors and legends are connected with armed conflicts since time immemorial. If you look, uh, if you look to the classical artistic renditions of Greek and Roman goddesses called Osa or Feme or Fama, uh, these beings, the supernatural beings, were often connected with war and or personal fame caused by military victories. So there's a great connection or, or ancient connection between fa rumors, Fama, and wars. Folklorists. Folklorists became interested in wartime folklore during the Second World War. It's very interesting because most studies uh, about wartime folklore uh, of the Second or the First World War were written immediately during the conflict. E.g. in Austro-Hungarian Empire, in my part of the world, we have several studies which were written in 1940, 1915, 1916. Georg Polivka, or Polivka, he was famous Czech folklorist. Uh, he wrote also during the conflict. So it's it's really connected. It was very topical. It was very current kind of, of folkloric analysis of wartime folklore. Probably the most important study of uh, First World War folklore is uh, written by Fernand van Langenhove. You, have seen, you can see the title. It has been published in Paris in 1916. And it's very, it's not folkloristic analysis. It's more like psychological, let's say, uh, but it's very uh, interesting analysis of rumor cycle about supposed atrocities of Belgian resistance fighters against German soldiers. This very study was also used as propaganda against the central powers, against Germany or Austria. Uh, during two years, it was reprinted several times. It was reprinted in London in 1916, in Madrid, in Spain in 1916, in Leiden, and in Zurich, in Switzerland. Uh, this is very interesting study worth reading even now because it's very topical. Uh, it it's, it talks a lot about like collective psychology and social psychology and how uh, hostilities can break out because of the legends and supposed supposed threat by by the enemy. Probably today, probably more known is uh, story of Angel of Mons. It's also Belgium. Uh, it's story of legendary saver or or saving even of British Expeditionary Army in Belgium. We have several uh, analyses, all, again, not uh, folkloric analyses, but psychologists and historians wrote about it. But again, immediately during the war, Polar, Hart, Oman, uh, probably the most exhaustive study is by British folklorist Dr. David Clark 
It's a book called Angel of Mont, which had been published in 2005. This is very similar to what we will be talking in a few minutes. There were, there, were big, there, were, there was big conflict, First World War, and folklorists and psychologists and historians tried to somehow grasp this text uh, uh, during the conflict. If we talk about modern, more contemporary study of wartime romance and legends, it started uh, during the Second World War. Uh, again, not many folklorists analyzed uh, these stories at that time. Uh, Many of these people were psychologists uh, or psychoanalysts. The, probably the most famous name is Marie Bonaparte. Uh, she published a very interesting book about myths of war. It has been published in French originally, but in the same year also in English in the US. Uh, she discussed many legends, rumors, and stories, uh, not only from Europe, but also from Southern Africa and other parts of the world, which take place uh, during the Second World War. She's also famous as author of studies about what is now, what is now called contem contemporary or urban legends. Uh, she famously wrote about the vanishing hitchhiker tail type in the 40s, some studies. More important than psychology was, uh, uh, or, uh, was social psychology. Uh, some names like Robert Knapp or Gordon Olpor or Leo Postman, they wrote uh, applied studies about rumors. Uh, the most famous is probably Psychology of Rumor, 1944. This is, this is, is still interesting even now. He classifies uh, rumors into three types, uh, pipe dreams, uh, 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 scary stories, uh, or bogies, and wedge drivers, some kind of uh, stories which drive wedges between some, some social groups, uh, groups of population, uh, they were, for example, anti-Semitic and so on. And so it's, it's still valid even now. We have more modern studies from 70s and 80s, which, uh, and in light of these studies, this knap uh, study of, from 44 still holds true. Uh, the same could be told also about all the postman study. It's actually a book, Psychology of Humor, which is classic in the study of rumors. As we if we speak about folklorists or ethnologists, they became more interested in wartime rumors and legends somewhat later, like in the 70s and 80s. And these were very often not uh, analyses of current affairs, but like retrospective analyses, mostly of First World War folklore or Second World War folklore. For example, in Eastern Europe and uh, Soviet Union, there were many studies about uh, Great Patriotic War or Second World War, retrospective analysis, bordering folklore and oral history, or some biographic narrations. Since the 80s and especially the 90s, uh, we have many studies, folkloric studies, uh, about the law of the current conflicts. There are too many studies to mention here, uh, so uh, you can find them elsewhere. And now I will proceed to the main part of my my lecture. Uh, just warning, attention, what follows is still work in progress. It's not complete today, complete paper, just some, some un, uh, brief analysis of what's going on on Ukraine now. So let's start. And let's start with the ghost of Kiev. Probably you heard of this. this it's, it was big on Western media and media all, all over the world. It's Privit Kieva in Ukrainian, uh, ghost of Kiev, or rather phantom of Kiev somehow. This is probably the first legend, or genealogically it's more rumored than legend, of the current Ukrainian conflict, uh, the very first. It appeared during the very first day of the conflict, actually, on Thursday, February 24th, uh, the story. The story first spread uh, on electronic social network, on the internet, mostly on Twitter, it's Twitter story, basically. Uh, we can uh, talk about narrative zero. There were three short uh, viral videos. Uh, I, I will try to, uh, to show you one of, the, of these videos. Three short viral videos of single Ukrainian MiG-29, which is called uh, Fulcrum in NATO designation. And this fighter was just flying low over city, uh, cityscape of Kiev. Yeah, it's a very short video. I will try to uh, show you one of these videos. It seems it doesn't work, so uh, you can you can uh, watch it your, by yourself. I will 
I will send you the PowerPoint presentation if you are interested. But it's basically nothing there. It's just it's just a very short video of some plane, identified MiG-29 plane flying low over Kiev cityscape. This legend or this story was first uh, at first very dialogic, as Linda Deck would write. Yeah. Uh, people were discussing the identity of this pilot, uh, about combat results of this pilot, why is flying so low over cityscape, maybe he's evading, evading uh, Russian uh, airplanes, or he's, he's doing some very specific, very brave, uh, outrageous maneuver. Yeah. So it was a discussion mostly first. But after a few hours, uh, mostly on Twitter, in, co uh, in comments, the main motif crystallized uh, that this, these videos are videos of single pilot, yes, uh, single pilot who single-handedly shot six enemy Russian airplanes during the first day of the war, during the first, let's say, four, 30 uh, hours of the conflict. So these very ephemeral videos became story. Yeah. Became crystallized into a story, single heroic fighter fighting uh, overhemling odds of the Russian planes and shooting six of them. We can trace the origin of this idea of the six Russian airplanes uh, shot down. This idea of six enemy planes shot down uh, during the first day of the war came actually from the official statement of the Ukrainian chief of the staff, uh, Valery Zaluzhny. Uh, from February the 24th, again, the first day of the conflict. Yeah. Uh, he just said that uh, Ukrainian armed forces or Ukrainian Air Force shot down six Russian airplanes during the first day, but uh, the, this, these results were collectively attributed to be acts of the single heroic pilot, yeah, this ghost of Kiev. So this story became the, the, the legend, we can say, which was the result of collective problem solving and wishful thinking. Yeah, because most of people in the comments actually were actually rather skeptical. Yeah, they didn't say, okay, this, this plane shot down six Russian airplanes. Yeah. They mostly expressed just a wish. Yeah. We wish we have some hero or we wish this ghost of Kiev, uh, Kiev being real. Yeah, it was some kind of make-believe kind of process. Yeah. What we know, it was mostly internet and social media thing. Yeah. Currently, we don't have much data about oil tradition. It supposedly existed, but uh, we don't know much about it. But this make-believe process was very, very interesting. It was very dialogic. It was dialogue in the internet. People invented the name, the ghost of Kiev, and uh, they just asked questions, and these questions became answers. OK, he really shot down his six airplanes. Very soon, this story became uh, very cleverly actually used by the Ukrainian propaganda. Actually, uh, as far as as fast as during the second day of the conflict, uh, during the February 25, the U Ukrainian Ministry of Defense seized the opportunity to encourage belief in this hero pilot. Uh, uh, they tweeted an image of MiG-29 as part of posting and this, which reported that retired pilots, retired Ukrainian pilots, were returning to the country Air Force. Yeah, and that tweet, you have links there. The tweet in Ukrainian actually said, "Who knows? Maybe one of them is the Air Avenger of the MiG-29, which is so often seen by the Kievites." And this was very clever. They didn't say, "Okay, the ghost of Kiev is real." Yeah, they just say, "Okay, we have many old, very experienced, skilled." retired pilots they are coming back they are using these old MiG-29s and who knows maybe one of them is the Air Avenger of the MiG-29. They, they even didn't use the name of Ghost of Kiev. They were an accurate name actually. Yeah. And during the same day they posted another wide, uh, video of Ghost of Kiev which was fighting and downing the Russian airplane. You can, you can google it if you are interested. And this last video was actually uh, actually fake yeah it was youtube video uh, which was actually tribute to the legend yeah it, it became legend already uh, the video which you can uh, see on youtube uh, it's called ghost of kiev dogfight and it was posted uh, during the second day of the conflict on youtube by a fan of the legend uh, nicknamed comrade corp probably russian uh, and it's it's uh, it's digitally altered it's uh, it has been completely created in online digital simulator called DCS World, simulator of the 
of the airplane dogfights. Yeah, so, but it was used by propaganda as real footage of ghost of Kiev downing Russian airplane. There were, uh, there were also other, other later official uses of the legend by the Ukrainian authorities. Not so clever, for example, uh, Ukrainian TV channel Five Canal, uh, which is owned by former Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, uh, posted some news about, about the coast of Kiev. Poroshenko himself also later shared a picture of the alleged heroic pilot on the second day of the conflict. It's the, it's the picture on the left. Yeah. So it was used more and more, but by now not official, official Ukrainian institutions, but mostly by individuals. Yeah, or some some commercial media. Yeah, there are some you can see some of the pictures which were used as to prove an identity and reality of of Ghost of Kiev. And to sum up, Ghost of Kiev is very interesting uh, topic actually. It's interesting mix of collective vernacular text, yeah, some kind of folklore you can label this rumor or legend. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand. It was very clever and cages use uh, of this story by Ukrainian media and Ukrainian uh, army and Ukrainian institution, followed by not so cautious, let's say, propaganda. Yeah, so it's very, very interesting kind of phenomenon. And it exploded, of course. Yeah, it became folklorized. Uh, original uh, six uh, Russian airplanes down, six shots became 11 in five days and much more later. Yeah. Later, also more pictures and tributes to Ghost of Cave appeared online, including Wikipedia pages in several languages, including Czech one. Uh, this one interesting was created by someone during the very first day of the conflict. Uh, and during the first two days, the Ghost of Cave also became global phenomenon, mostly because of English speaking media. Uh, there details of the supposed shots appeared. Uh, probably they were created by Spanish sport tabloid Marca, uh, which and they have been later copy pasted by many media worldwide, especially uh, English speaking media. Uh, there were details that the ghost of Kiev shot actually two Russians, uh, SU-35, one SU-27, one MiG-29 and two uh, SU-25s. It's very it's not really realistic. Yeah, some of these planes were not present in the Ukraine, actually, in the first day of the, of the conflict. And actually, most Western military media could use the luxury of staying out of the conflict, and this became skeptical. Yeah. If Ghost of Cape was real, it would become first European fighter ace after first, the Second World War, actually. We have to shot, uh, shot down five enemy airplanes to become ace. Yeah, he, he supposedly shot six in the first first uh, day of the conflict. Uh, if we go to the technical explanation, Ukraine really have uh, this kind of fighter, this kind of airplane, MiG-29. Uh, it has 35 or 37 of them, but uh, they were used mostly for training purposes, for education purposes of pilots. Uh, most of them had old equipment, so they will, it will be very unrealistic if some this plane shot down some better equipped Russian planes. And if you look to the original video of Ghost of Kiev, uh, these original viral videos on Twitter, this make is unarmed. Yeah. So there's, there, he has no rockets. Uh, this type of MiG-29, Fulcrum usually carries six rockets, so he, he uh, had to be successful with each single shot to shot down six Russian airplanes. So in technical terms, it's very, very uh, unrealistic. But it's not important for us, yeah? and especially not for the Ukrainians living in the conflict. It's very important for boosting morale. Yeah? It's not just a propaganda. It's, it's uh, important for the collective spirit of the nation. So here you can see some, some uh, internet art on Pinterest and other, other media about the coast of Kiev. The first one on the left is the, the oldest original one. Yeah, you can see it's very naive, but it's very, very, very nice. There are other pictures uh, below. You can see the, the, the drawing of Ghost of King saving Ukraine from the Russian invasion. Uh, on the left, it's more recent uh, fabrication on Twitter. It's a supposed identity of the Ghost of Kiev 
uh, he has a name now, is Vladimir Abdonov, the Ukrainian pilot who down six Russian jets, jets and it's it's fake, actually, the, the, the head of the guy on the picture is some uh, Brazilian lawyer, I believe, yeah, some lawyer from Brasilia, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's more, but it's more recent. Yeah, uh, I'm more interested in the more original, more collective, more folkloric pattern of this. This is much later. This was tweeted on February 26th. Yeah, and it, it, it wasn't much. Pop it wasn't really popular in Ukraine or elsewhere. Yeah. So it's, it's other attempt to create some fake identity for this for this pilot. But this, uh, I, I told that uh, there was not much oral tradition about Ghost of Kiev uh, documented. Actually, I have one for you. It's not from the Ukraine, sadly, but it's from my country, from Czechia, Czech Republic. And it's actually an expert narrative documented by my colleague, Dr. Jindřiška Kracíková. She's head of the Wallenstein, Wallenstein Museum in small town of Jíčín in Czechia. Uh, on March 23, so let's say one month, four weeks after the start of the conflict and the birth of the ghost of Kiev. Uh, it's very interesting. It's not it's not saying anything about the uh, lore of the Ukrainians in the Ukraine. It's more like expat narrative. So I can read it for you. The respondent or narrator uh, was a man called Pavel, uh, age about 50, of Ukrainian nationality. He hails from the area of southwestern Ukraine, which is called Transcarpathian Oblast, and he has been working in the Czech Republic for a long time, several decades actually, as a construction worker. Yeah, he's a big grand expert worker. The narrative situation was like this. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, Mr. Pavel came to the Wallenstein Museum before noon to look for the owner, who is known among Ukrainian expats in the Yichin region, as a philanthropist who willingly lent his boarding house to Ukrainian refugees. Mr. Pavel wanted to ask him for a job because his current employer in town of Radec Králové calls his employees Ukrainian dicks, which Mr. Pavel no longer wants to suffer. The continuous and fluent conversation gradually turned to the war situation in the Ukraine when Mr. Pavel suddenly began, began to tell about the ghost of Kiev with enthusiasm and deep enthusiasm. The ghost of Kiev is great, it's great. He has already shot down 49 Russian planes himself. The Russians hit him, but he managed to eject, landed safely with a parachute, and went to report to his unit. And there he got a new plane. And uh, uh, Dr. Kerstinkova asked, so the Kiev ghost still flies? Oh yeah, he still flies and continues to shoot down Russian plane, planes. So we can see it's it's some kind of interpretation of this story by Ukrainian diaspora, by Ukrainian expats in the Czech Republic. He tells this and this guy's enthusiasm completely fascinated that one aviator can shoot down so many Russian planes. He's firmly convinced of the existence of the ghost of Kiev, as well as of his constant active struggle, the 24th day of the war in Ukraine. The informant resides in the Czech Republic throughout the war in Ukraine, so his narration most likely illustrates the idea of local Ukrainian expats, not incoming refugees. We have a lot of Ukrainian refugees here in Prague and Czech Republic, mostly uh, women and children, like over 300,000, but we didn't, uh, uh, didn't conduct field work yet on these people. They have other works to do, actually. Okay, so Ghost of Kiev. It's very recent uh, legend, but it, it has many interesting folkloric historical parallels. More interest, the most close is probably the Pipo, yeah, the famous mysterious art, uh, aircraft of the Second World War in Italy. Italian historian uh, Giovanni De Luna called Pipo the most unsettling aspect of wartime Italy, actually. So it was a big thing. Yeah, it was kind, some kind of mysterious plane with specific sound which fly only during the night. Some people say he's, he's a light plane. Some people say it was a fascist plane. Uh, he was, it was popular mostly in the last uh, three uh, years of the war in Northern Italy. There were legends about the people. There were rumors about the people, even folk songs and children rubbish about the people. The name is kind of mysterious. The people was named probably uh, onomatopoeically after distinctive pip-pip sound of this mysterious plane, 
or because of the Italian name of the Goofy character by Walt Disney, that the dog, yeah, it's called Pippo. It's not Goofy, it's Pippo in Italy. This uh, legend was probably inspired by specific sound of British plane, the Havian Mosquito, which flew through very often during the night. This is a nighttime bomber or a spy plane, and this is probably a source of these, these interesting rumors, which are still remembered in Italy uh, by, by older generation. Another interesting folkloric parallel, historical parallel of uh, Ghost of Cave is Springman. It's from my country, Springman in Czech, we call him Perak or Perový muž. Actually, it's Czech version of international uh, migratory urban legend about Springhill Jack, which was originally British or English character from the Victorian England. Uh, this Springman, this mysterious phantom, was most active during the Second World War in Czech urban centers, mostly industrial towns like Prague, Pilsen, Brno, and others. And this Springman was some kind of night avenger. He was jumping on steel springs across rooftops, jumping across trams, across buses, uh, and so on. And he was battling Nazis and collaborators with the Nazis. Yeah. It was some kind, we can label him Ghost of Prague. Yeah. Uh, and after the war, this story was very popular. And after the war, it was in literature and popular culture. Uh, the Springman was reimagined as Czech, some kind of Czech nationalistic hero. Now in comic and, and uh, similar media in popular culture, the Springman is labeled as first Czech superhero, some kind of combination of Captain America, who was, fight, who was fighting the Nazis, Batman, a nighttime urban avenger of crime, Spider-Man, he's sleeping like a Spider-Man or, or Superman. But his origin were in all the edition. Actually, he came from the from the uh, uh, Victorian England. Uh, if you are interested more in this character, I, I have a short study about the Springman, which was published in Fabula uh, two years ago. And also, I wrote a book about the Springman, which will be published in the US in English edition later this year. It deals not only with the Springman in Czech lands, but also with the German versions of the Springman, Hipfelman, Spiralhopsen, Russian versions uh, of the Springman. Uh, they were active during the Second World War, but also uh, during the uh, Russian Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution in the 20s, English version, US version, and Slovakian versions. I can show you some pictures. It's from contemporary Czech comic and popular culture. The spring man is battling the Nazis in Prague and escaping them. He's jumping on the steel spring across the Prague, like a ghost of Prague. The picture on the left is actually the cover, supposed cover of my English book about the spring man, which will be published this year. And on the right, you can see it's from the uh, Russian uh, Museum of uh, Militia of police in St. Petersburg, uh, and it's actually a model of this Russian uh, spring man, Paprigunchiki, of the 20s. So everything is in my book, actually. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about the second legend. We talk about the ghost of Kiev. Let's talk about the second legend, uh, the Ukrainian Reaper. Actually, it's later legend. It's more fabricated or more fake legend, which somehow tried to capitalize on success of the ghost of Kiev. Yeah, it, it wasn't so, so popular. It was popularized in English speaking media, mostly again by Spanish tabloid Marca since February 26. And it has no really strong narrative core. It's, it's mostly just a rumor, a rumor about some anonymous Ukrainian soldier who single handedly killed 20 Russian soldiers in just two days. Usually, this uh, story is accompanied by the picture below. Some kind of Ukrainian soldier with his eyes covered. Yeah. But you can feel the aura of mystery is missing here. So it's not, it, maybe that's the reason it's, it never became really popular. Uh, sometimes, actually very often, this, uh, this soldier is depicted as a sniper, sniping Russians. Sometimes he has a name, Volodymyr Vist, again in tabloid. And, this kind of media, but it's not really popular. Actually, this legend is a kind of failed legend compared to Ghost of Kiev, and in, in its structure, it's very similar to legend of Juba or Joba. Uh, it was legendary sniper of Iraq resistance against US armed forces during Iraq insurrection of 25 or 26. 
This is some pictures, more recent pictures of Ukrainian Reaper. Yeah. You can see even the Lego, uh, Lego character of, the, of this Ukrainian Reaper. But again, it's more like a fight legend. Uh, it's not so popular as Ghost of Kiev for obvious reasons. And let's talk about the, the Juba. Or Juba, it's it's kind of template for Ukrainian Reaper. Uh, it was legendary folk hero, sniper, or Iraq resistance against US armed forces. Uh, mostly, this legend was propagated mostly by the so-called Islamic Army of Iraq. He supposedly killed at least 37 of US soldiers. Uh, this was similar to the Ghost of Kiev. It was uh, based on videos. Yeah, it was very short, uh, low quality videos. Uh, Ghost of Kiev is Twitter legend. This Juba was YouTube legend. Or you can buy DVD in Baghdad, other Iraq, Iraqi towns uh, with, with very, uh, very low quality videos. There are mostly three videos of this Juba or Java popular. Yeah, and it's it's very similar template which uh, Ukrainian Reaper tries to try to capitalize on. Actually, this Juba character inspired uh, picture, pictures character of Mustafa in famous movie American Sniper, uh, directed by Clint Eastwood. You can see picture from this this movie below, and you, you can see some even comic about the uh, Juba. Uh, he was some kind of violent player, but his family was killed by the by the U.S. bombing, American air attacks. So we switch his violin for a rifle, uh, for a dragon of sniper rifle. There are some comic, actually, uh, I believe, made in the West uh, about this this famous famous, let's say, Iraqi or Baghdad Reaper, which became more popular than Ukrainian Reaper now. And finally, the third legend. Uh, White tides. White tides in Russian Belia Kolgotki or Belia Chulki. We can translate it in English as white pantyhose or white stocking. This is very famous, very famous Russian wartime rumor and contemporary urban legend, yeah, which is actually quite old. It appeared first in the 80s. Yeah. It's a story about fictitious elite unit of blonde snipers, blonde female snipers, which hail either from the Baltics. Yeah, from the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, this is the original version, or the Ukraine, or the Western Europe, yeah, in later versions. Yeah. And this story reportedly emerged during every war with Russian involvement yeah, in the last few decades. From the uh, First and Second War in Chechnya, uh, through the conflicts in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Transnistria, Abkhazia, Georgia in 2008, and most recently in Eastern Ukraine. Yeah, in Donbass region. Yeah. So, who are the white tides? The white tides are allegedly former female biathlon team yeah, from Baltic states or Ukraine or the West that volunteered for the war. Why? They volunteered because they hate all, uh, all everything Russian. They hate Russians. Yeah. So they volunteer, they have skills. And uh, these stories have two symbolic meanings. On the one hand, they uh, try to legitimize the war conflict caused by the Russian Federation. Yeah. And uh, there's other more internal meaning. Yeah, these negative heroines of these stories combine two Russian stereotypes. One stereotype of the witch, yeah, which is very evil, but also some it, it could be very attractive and very symbolically powerful woman like Baba Yaga. Yeah, she can be also young and attractive, but she's also also evil, yeah, or, or at least liminal kind of being. So this is one stereotype. The second stereotype is Western fascist. Yeah, it's very open label fascist, but uh, on the core is is uh, some kind of visualization of blue-eyed, uh, uh, blonde Nordic aggressor in the Second World War. And these women are also blonde, blondes, but not the dumb blondes of the jokes, of the joke cycle, but, but very, very uh, dangerous snipers, actually hating everything Russian, and especially hating Russian males. Yeah, and this is very Freudian, psychoanalytical motifs there, yeah, because the popularity of these stories is supported by castration motifs. These insidious white tights are said to interfere with men, to show them exclusive in the crotch. You know, and this uh, symbolically, but also, also 
realistically destroy Russia effort to defend against enemies. Yeah, so they 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 stop the procreation of Russian men and population, and it's it's also a very insidious tactic. Actually, we don't have many reports about the white types appearing now in the Ukraine. We had some in Donbass in the last few, uh, eight, eight years. Now it's we have some uh, Twitter and contact here, which is, which is basically Russian Facebook post, but uh, uh, the white types just uh, are just waiting for appear. I am almost sure they, are, they appeared in military law or oral tradition of the Russian armed forces, but we don't have many contacts here. Uh, now with, with with these people, so so maybe later we will have, we will know more about the white tides in, in the Ukraine. But I'm sure they will return because they return every time. Actually, since the war in Afghanistan in the 80s. And some pictures. This is uh, on the left. You can see white tides training in Baltics or, or somewhere in, in Europe uh, as, as biathlon sportsmen. And on the right, it's fighting in somewhere with Russian soldiers. There are a lot of art about uh, Bielie Chulky or Bielie Kolgotki, uh, white tights in the internet. There are some very, very nice ones posted mostly by Russian artists. So it's a kind of kind of popular culture even now. Uh, there are a lot of lot more about this, about these white tights. Yeah. OK, so let's conclude. Uh, we can say that during contemporary armed conflict in Ukraine, we can see many news uh, con which contain folkloric themes and folkloric motifs. Many of them are actually not new, but are interpretations of older themes and motifs, or even tale types, which we can find in previous armed conflicts. And some of them uh, could be possibly even genealogically classified as legends, contemporary legends, or urban legends, or rumors. We can see emergence or re-emergence of many folkloric texts and practices, and we can see legends in the making. And this situation actually poses many interesting uh, questions, questions which can be labeled as heuristic, epistemological, and methodological. For example, how to conceptualize differences between folklore or phenomena, which we call folklore, like legends and rumors, and phenomena which are uh, labeled by journalists and politicians as hoaxes, fake news, disinformation, and propaganda. Yeah. There are clearly ties. We, can, we, we could see it uh, in Ghost of Kiev and Ukraine paper. They are intertwined, folklore and propaganda, disinformation. And it's very interesting to, to watch it now unfold uh, during this sad Ukrainian conflict, which will hopefully end very soon. Okay, uh, if you want more information, uh, including literature, bibliography, uh, papers I cited, uh, I'm preparing study based on my lecture, which will be published hopefully this year, either in Fabula or uh, Journal of Folklore and Popular Culture, which is Polish journal, originally called Literatura Dova. So I hope there will be more information uh, when this conflict, uh, this sad conflict ends, and I hope, I hope it will. I believe we all hope that this, this unfortunate war will end soon. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward for your question, comments, critique, and, and so on during the discussion.